right, would you join me in the book of Zechariah? Continuing our study in the Minor Prophets tonight, uh, Pastor Matt in the last two weeks covered the book of Haggai. Very grateful for him uh, jumping in when I was not feeling very well. So we covered that, and I was a little bit jealous because he got to make the jump of time from the pre-exilic prophets to the post-exilic prophets. Um, so what we've covered so far, you know, we've, we, we saved Joel and Obadiah. Aside from those two, we've covered Jonah, Hosea, Amos, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, all of these pre-exilic prophets with varying styles according to God's intention for them, their own personalities and their own oracles from him, some of them with very similar themes because they're uh, um, approaching the same topics by the voice of God. They're addressed the, the false and horrible leadership and attacked often the, the priests and the princes and how they misled the people and they were not being humble. They had abandoned the law of God and were using it for their own gain. All of these attacks, we saw those very similarly throughout the pre-exilic prophets. And then what happened while I was away was the Babylon came through. All of these things we've been talking about for months and months and months, they occurred in the silence of, uh, of the time between uh, Zephaniah and the book you considered in the last two weeks, Haggai. So the destruction that had been so long predicted, for centuries predicted, it finally arrived at the hand of Babylon, a terrifying reality for Judah. Uh, and it was a fulfillment of these prophecies that we've looked at. And we've also considered that it was a pattern of the way that the prophets would be fulfilled in the day of the Lord. This is how God sovereignly uses instruments for his righteousness. It's how he sovereignly opposes sin and evil. And it's in anticipation even of what he will do. I think you talked a few weeks ago about the fact of some of these historical points that the Babylonian captivity, the capturing of Judah, did not occur all at once. It occurred in phases. Uh, there was initial, um, maybe moderate, and then final captivity for Judah. So that began in 605 with Nebuchadnezzar, and this is where we would enter uh, Daniel being taken into captivity where the, the first and the finest of Judah were taken by the king. And then about um, eight years later, you have uh, a puppet king that Nebuchadnezzar had uh, set in place in Judah. He's taken captive and Ezekiel's taken captive at the same time. And then um, nine years after that, now the temple is destroyed and the city is essentially demolished. Most of the Jews are taken into exile at this point. The remaining people are, are very few and there's no, nothing really that's discernible as a government or, or a people that is left. So in these three phases, the Babylonian captivity occurred. Now, we have not examined in this study the major prophets but in the final major prophet before the Babylonians came through, which was Jeremiah, I think probably Pastor Matt mentioned this as well a few weeks ago, but in Jeremiah chapter 25, he explicitly prophesies even the length of time that they will be in captivity in Babylon. It's these 70 years. Um, and so this was explicitly predicted and came to pass. So over you know, in 70 years time, the Persians came through and they attacked the Babylonians. He overthrows the, the proto-Babylonian empire and he decrees that Jews can begin returning. Now that the return takes place in phases as well. 
um, much like the, the exile took place in phases. So the book of Haggai was really the first prophet upon the return. Now, they've already been back for a while, and he was addressing some of their misplaced priorities and encouraging them not to reiterate the pattern of their, of their fathers. And what we learn in the book of Ezra is that Haggai had a companion prophet, and his name is Zechariah. And so you looked, uh, Haggai's a pretty short book and took place over a short period of time. You notice all these um, time markers that were mentioned in ha- uh, Haggai, the second year of, of King Darius, the sixth month, the first day of the month, all the way to the final um, marker being the 24th day of the month, which was the ninth month. Uh, from that day, the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. And so it was, all this was taking place from Haggai's perspective in the second year of King Darius from the sixth month to the ninth month. So in three months time. Now during that time, if you'll notice Zechariah 1.1, his prophecies begin in the eighth month of the second year of Darius. So it is concurrent with Haggai. His first prophecy comes in the middle of Haggai's short window of prophecies. So these are really not biological, but these are brother prophets who are prophesying with specific messages to the same group of people uh, in the same time period. Uh, So that's uh, who it is. In in that regard, much of the background work has already been laid because the same background work for Haggai is the background work for Zechariah. Their personalities seem to be a little bit different. Some of their function seems to be a little bit different. Their style certainly is. The way that God uh, uses them as prophets is, is a little bit unique. So really the question that we're faced here and what, and what I encourage you to consider historically as we try to place ourselves in this moment is that this is a time in Israel and Judah's history of tremendous excitement and that they're back home, they're back in their place, but it's also, it, it's, confusion might not be quite the right word, but maybe wondering what's next? What do we do now that we're here and okay, so we're building, we're sort of getting these things moving again. But what do we do as it, as it concerns prophecy? What do we do as it concerns the word of the Lord? What do we do uh, as it concerns this kingdom? Is this kingdom that was prophesied, this whole day of the Lord that even Zephaniah talked about right before the exile? We have that. What, is that now? Are we in that time period? And that's one of the things that Zechariah um, does is the the voice of God is present again with his people in their excitement slash maybe emptiness, just sort of the, the where do we go now? And as a New Testament assembly, I think one other thing that's helpful for us as we consider Zechariah is that Zechariah, Haggai, Zechariah, and then Malachi, these are the final words before Jesus. These are the final words before the apostles and the final words before the gospels and the epistles. And so these things were very present on the minds of the people to whom Jesus appeared, among whom Jesus walked. That Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi these are the, this is the, the next phase. It's kind of what they have to, to go off of in their recent history. That following with that idea. Um, and so as we approach Zechariah, you will see something that uh, lost is too strong of a word. It's not that we've lost this by any means, but it would be um, valuable for us to recapture is that in the mind of the New Testament church, like we should be thinking in terms of Zechariah. We should be thinking in terms of Malachi and Haggai. This is, this is a lot you'll see throughout here as we did in Haggai. You'll see a lot of heavy New Testament themes in this book. 
as the final anticipation, the final prophetic words of the Messiah are uh, like paved for, for Judah. Um, there, there's a lot here concerning Christ and who he's going to be and what he's going to do in his incarnation and in the eschaton. Okay. Um, a few of the distinctives, things we should be thinking as we think about Zechariah. It's, a, it's the, um, I didn't double check this. It's either the longest or close to the longest. It's certainly the longest post-exilic prophet. He's 14 chapters long. So longer than most of them. Um, maybe the, the majorest minor prophet, right? If that's really the distinction between the two. Um, he uses, is, is just kind of go back to back a few different distinctives. He uses the title, the Lord of hosts, 53 times. And that's, I think, about two thirds of the times that he uses the word Yahweh. So Yahweh is a very prominent theme. And his specific title, the Lord of hosts, rises to preeminence in these, really in the post-exilic prophets. Uh, Zechariah is an example of them. So just consider the comparison. Uh, the Lord of hosts was used one time in Hosea, one time in Micah, one time in Habakkuk, twice in Nahum, three times in Zephaniah, and the most of the pre-exilic prophets nine times in Amos which is also one of the longer ones. Okay, so as many as nine times, or I didn't calculate those all together, but you know, less than 20 total. And now in this one prophet, 53 times. In Haggai from the last two weeks, 14 times in two chapters. Now we have 53 in 14 chapters. And then in Malachi, the final post-exilic prophet, 24 times in four chapters, All right? So this is heavy, a he very heavy dose of this title. Now, why, why would that be? Why is the Lord of hosts so significant in the post-exilic prophets? Well, uh, we do our due diligence to understand first the title itself, the Lord of hosts, and it's used all throughout the Old Testament. And we know it very well from the Psalms, particularly many Psalms use this title. It's an, it's an, old, uh, it's an old one. But the idea is his commanding, his authority, his military oversight over the angelic hosts that he has at his disposal 10,000 angels, that he, that he is the commander of the angel armies. That's really the, uh, the primary idea of this title. Why would that be significant? Well, you're talking to a people who anticipate having, possessing, by the word of the prophets, great strength, great military, great political might and authority. And they're returning with nothing. They're returning having been decimated. They're returning with a trowel and perhaps a sword. Like they, they don't have much. They're certainly not, not trained militaristically. They don't, they're appointing a governor. They're appointing a high, a high priest. They're, they're starting from scratch. And so the idea that you would have Yahweh, the commander of all military might, all strength and power to be able to cause that which he has promised is a point of great hope to a people uh, weakened. Perhaps you might even say the weakest of all the nations in this moment, very vulnerable. So that's one of the distinctives in the post-exilic prophets is the title, the Lord of hosts. In Zechariah particularly, um, we have very dramatic visions. I haven't seen this for a little while in the prophets, but we'll see as we walk through the structure, there's a section where there are eight visions at close to the beginning of the book. And they're all like, I mean, not like our dreams and our dreams are inspired, but they're like our dreams in that they are weird. They're odd. They have all sorts of apparently random things happening, unusual images and dramatic poetic language that is uh, common in prophecies, common in visions and, and oracles. 
but is one of the most dramatic representations of it, certainly in the Minor Prophet. There's a unique emphasis in Zechariah on the high priest. The same one, even as named in Haggai, a particular emphasis on Joshua, the high priest. So not Joshua, the one that led (laughs) our most common Joshua, but Joshua, the high priest that was named next to Zerubbabel in Haggai. So Zerubbabel is the governor, and in Haggai, he has the signet ring. He has royal authority. And in Zechariah, you'll see as we walk through that Joshua, the high priest, is crowned. A little bit odd, but an emphasis on the royal priest we find in Zechariah. Um, then in the second part of the book, after the visions and um, the quite vivid visions there, you have um, a repetition of themes, themes concerning the Messiah, really, that he is going to arrive, um, some snapshots of, of his offices and roles, that he's um, a shepherd, that he is pierced, that he uh, rides on a donkey, that's found here. So, so his um, arrival as an authority and some of the qualities of his authority. The purity and finality, the final purity, purging that he's going to bring by means of uh, a violent battle. So this future judgment of the enemies of Israel. You can understand at this vulnerable point in their post-exilic state that they might be left a little bit scratching their heads saying, okay, so we were delivered. That's wonderful. And Babylon was destroyed, but now Persia's in control. Really, the enemies of God, the powerful enemies haven't been abolished. So is that now? Is that happening? So the, these, these words of, of future final judgment of the enemies of Judah is stated. And that means then future and final deliverance for Judah. So all, all sort of four of those themes, we'll see um, very uh, brilliantly displayed, um, cyclically displayed, kind of, kind of like this, the second half of Zechariah is easy to put into its component parts, but not always easy to see how those component parts relate. Uh, if you remember, as we preach through Hebrews and even as we're working through Genesis, the, the Hebrew mind is, is, a, is a very intricate place, <laughs> a, a, very different than how we think, and the way that, not, not in a negative way, but that they would weave a web of like their thoughts are more woven or we were talking this afternoon with Pastor Man used the illustration of a, a vine. You know, it's kind of tangled. And that, that certainly is true in the second half. It's not necessarily chronological. You'll see repeated uh, cycles of things in the second half of the book. Okay, so I didn't really use these visuals as we walked through, but um, we are in the final column there, the return and restoration nearby Ezra and Nehemiah, actually prior to Ezra and Nehemiah, so right at the beginning, really, of the restoration. And then let's walk through the structure a little bit of the book. Some of it is, are, there's some things I've said, others that we haven't, and then after walking through the structure, we will we'll read the book, and we need to leave a little bit more time for that tonight because it is, it is longer. It's 14 chapters. So we begin in the first six verses, with the introduction. And the introduction is really a a call to repentance. The phrase that we would know as return to me is what Yahweh calls for from the people. He compares their previous walk with, or or, so the pre, he he looks to the past. He says, don't be like your fathers. Um, sort of like Haggai saying, don't settle the city with misplaced priorities. Establish the city on truth this time around. And so don't be like them whom the former prophets preached to. Um, Instead, be willing to, to hear me. And it says, so they returned and said, just as the Lord of hosts determined to do to us according to our ways and according to our deeds, so he has dealt with us. 
And so there, there seems to be a proper response here. Okay, so that's the, the introduction. And then he jumps right in um, to these visions that he sees by night. There's eight of them. A vision of a man on a red horse with other horses surrounding him. You'll see New Testament themes picked up and Revelation is one of the main places that Zechariah's images are picked up. So uh, a man on a horse. Um, and the intention of that vision is that there is coming vengeance despite what is presently a peaceful time. Um, a vision of horns, four horns, and then craftsmen promising that the, those who are afflictors will be dealt with, will be demolished in the end. There's a vision of a surveyor, someone who comes with a plumb line to Jerusalem and Jerusalem is, is measured and there will be prosperity um, for God's people. There's the high priest. Now that one should sort of spark our attentions. We've talked about that as a theme. Uh, and the intention of this vision is to describe the cleansing of the nation. And Joshua is, is the, the one that's used here in the image, the vision. Uh, then there's a golden lamp stand and two olive trees. And these are intended to communicate the, the, the power that is available through God's spirit. There's a flying scroll, <laughs> a vision of a flying scroll um, which is a curse on lawbreakers. There's a woman in a basket, which is the removal of wickedness. And then there's four chariots. As we go through, we'll, we'll look a little bit at the interconnectedness of even these uh, visions to one another. There's eight very vivid visions in the first six chapters. Then chapter six concludes... Um, with an oracle about the high priest. Uh, the word of the Lord comes to Zechariah and they fashion a crown. They make an elaborate crown and they set it on the head of Joshua, um, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. So the same one that was found in Haggai. And uh, I believe that the, that the intention of this is to communicate that the future king is a, is a royal priestly king. Well, there's, there's that so almost as a standalone oracle. And then in chapter seven and eight, probably the best way to think of it is wrapping up what, ha what was and moving towards what will be within the prophet Zechariah. And he talks a lot about Jerusalem and what Jerusalem once was compared to what Jerusalem is right now, compared to what Jerusalem will be in the future. And he really, this middle part is where he's addressing some of the questions of where do we go from here? Because we know where we were, we know where we are, and we know what is going to be promised. And he sort of brings those things together in chapter seven and eight uh, in relationship to the city, Jerusalem, the holy city of the future, this place, the, the city of Zion, okay? Um, then the second, maybe half of the book, Chapters 9 through 14 is divided into two sections, 9 through 11 and then 12 through 14. And this is where the snapshots take place and the repetitive themes take place that might be difficult to assign specific chronology in relationship to one another, but are communicating these themes of the arrival of the Messianic King, the final purity that he brings, future judgment on the enemies, and the future deliverance of Judah. Those four themes we're going to see time and time again in these final uh, chapters. Um, one of the ways he does that is this word, the word of use snapshots, is, he's, is he um, paints pictures of the Messiah. So the king is riding on a donkey and he brings peace. There's one image from chapter nine. Chapter 10, the shepherd rallies Israel. Um, chapter 11, the shepherd is rejected and he's replaced. That one is particularly interesting and complex in, in relationship to, to Zechariah, perhaps as a shepherd and, and the future Jesus that he's representing as uh, the leader is rejected and replaced by other false shepherds. In chapter 12, the piercing of the defender of Israel. 
Chapter 13, the shepherd king is stricken. Chapter 14, the king fights for Jerusalem and then he reigns in Jerusalem. Now that isn't as clear pictures of Jesus as we could get. I don't know what is. And so you see a very heavy Christological, a messianic emphasis on the voice of God to the people of God following their captivity. In their recent freedom, he wants them to anticipate the next phase, which is the arrival of Jesus. And more than the, pro the prophets before, um, Zechariah speaks, as you'll see, uh, it, in moments that apply not only to the end, but also to the incarnation. Uh, so he, re he really does anticipate it in a way the other prophets haven't emphasized the arrival of the king in as much as sort of like Ze uh, Zephaniah, you know, this day of the Lord that was presented. It was less focused on the incarnation and more focused perhaps on the eschaton. And one thing that we'll try to develop as we go through Zechariah is the relationship of the incarnation to the day of the Lord. That this really is the beginning of the day of the Lord. It's where he established uh, the spiritual realities that will play themselves out physically in the day of the Lord. That, that darkness and evil has been dealt with. It has been conquered. It is uh, destined for destruction. And righteousness reigns. It has, that it has been won, the day has been won on the cross, spiritually speaking. And yet then we move right from there into the New Testament where Jesus physically leaves. We're left in that first and second Peter sort of exile state. Like, why is that? Because the physical day of the Lord, perhaps, uh, the, the actual measuring out of the judgment in time and space has yet to take place where, our, where that which we believe is going to be visual. It will be, our faith will be made sight, okay? Um, okay, so with all of these things in mind, I think it'll take about 20 minutes uh, to read through the book. So I turn your attention to Zechariah 1.1, 1, 1, and we're going to hear from the Lord from the book of Zechariah and then have a few concluding thoughts. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, the prophet, saying, The Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets preached, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds. But they did not heed me or hear me, says the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? Yet surely my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they returned and said, just as the Lord of hosts determined to do to us according to our ways and according to our deeds, so he has dealt with us. On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Idu, the prophet. I saw by night. And behold, a man riding on a red horse, and it stood among the myrtle trees in the hollow, and behind him were horses red, sorrel, and white. Then I said, my Lord, what are these? So the angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. And the man who stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are the ones whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro throughout the earth. So they answered the angel of the Lord who stood among the myrtle trees and said, we have walked to and fro throughout the earth and behold, all the earth is resting quietly. It's the present peace. 
And the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which you were angry these 70 years? And the Lord answered the angel who talked to me with good and comforting words. So the angel who spoke with me said to me, proclaim saying, thus says the Lord of hosts. I am zealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great zeal. I am exceedingly angry with the nations at ease. For I was a little angry and they helped, but with evil intent. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, says the Lord of hosts. And a surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Remember that one for the future. Again, proclaim saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, my cities shall again spread out through prosperity. The Lord will again comfort Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. Vision number two. Then I raised my eyes and looked and there were four horns. And I said to the angel who talked with me, What are these? So he answered me, these are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. And I said, what are these coming to do? So he said, these are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could lift up its head. But the craftsmen are coming to terrify them to cast out the horns of the nations that lifted up their horn against the land of Judah to scatter it. Vision number three. Then I raised my eyes and looked and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. So I said, where are you going? And he said to me to measure Jerusalem, to see what is its width and what is its length. And there was the angel who talked with me going out and another angel was coming out to meet him who said to him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls because of the multitude of men and livestock in it. For I, says the Lord, will be a wall of fire all around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. Up, flee from the land of the north, says the Lord, for I have spread you abroad like the four winds of heaven, says the Lord. Up, Zion, escape you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. For thus says the Lord of hosts, he sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them and they shall become spoil for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. For behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst, says the Lord. Many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and they shall become my people. And I will dwell in your midst. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And the Lord will take possession of Judah and as his inheritance in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. Be silent all flesh before the Lord, for he is roused from his holy habitation. Vision number four. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose, to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Remember that image. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments, and he was standing before the angel. And he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and they put the clothes on him and the angel of the Lord stood by. Then the Lord, the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and if you will keep my command, 
then you shall also judge my house and likewise have charge of my courts and I will give you places to walk among these who stand here. Here, O Joshua the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon the stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. Vision number five. Now the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me. As a man who was wakened out of his sleep, and he said to me, what do you see? So I said, I'm looking, and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it, and on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. And beside it, two olive trees, one at the right hand of the bowl and the other at its left. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me saying, what are these, my Lord? So the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. So he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by my, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. And he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands shall also finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord, which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. Then I answered and said to him, what are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand and at its left? And I further answered and said to him, what are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the two gold pipes from which the golden oil drains? Then he answered me and said, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. So he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Vision number six. Then I turned and raised my eyes and saw there a flying scroll. And he answered to me, or he, and he said to me, what do you see? So I answered, I see a flying scroll. <laughs> its length is 20 cubits and its width 10 cubits. Then he said to me, that is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole earth. Every thief shall be expelled according to this side of the scroll. And every perjurer shall be expelled according to that side of the scroll. I will send out the curse, says the Lord of hosts. It shall enter the house of the thief and the house of the one who swears falsely by my name. It shall remain in the midst of his house and consume it with its timber and stones. Vision number seven. Then the angel who talked with me came out and said to me, Lift your eyes now and see what goes forth. So I asked, what is it? And he said, it's a basket that is going forth. He also said, this is their resemblance throughout the earth. Here is a lead disc lifted up. And this is a woman sitting inside the basket. Then he said, this is wickedness. And he thrust her down into the basket and threw the lead cover over its mouth. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were two women coming with the wind in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the basket between earth and heaven. So I said to the angel who talked with me, where are they carrying the basket? And he said to me, to build a house for it in the land of Shinar. When it is ready, the basket will be set there on its base. Vision number eight. Then I turned and raised my eyes and looked. Behold, four chariots were coming from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. With the first chariot, there were red horses. With the second chariot, black horses. With the third chariot, white horses. And with the fourth chariot, dappled horses, strong steeds. 
Then I answered and said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said to me, these are four spirits of heaven who go out from their station before the Lord of all the earth. The one with the black horses is going to the north country. The white are going after them and the dappled are going towards the south country. Then the strong steeds went out eager to go that they might walk to and fro throughout the earth. And he said, go walk to and fro throughout the earth. So they walked to and fro throughout the earth. And he called me and spoke to me saying, see, those who go toward the north country have given rest to my spirit in the north country. This is the end of the visions. Now to consider the priestly king crowned. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, receive the gift from the captives, from Heldai, Tobijah, and Jedidiah, who have come from Babylon and go the same day and enter the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Take the silver and gold, make an elaborate crown and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Then speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is Branch. From his, from his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory, and he shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Now the elaborate crown shall be for a, for a memorial in the temple of the Lord for Helem, Tobijah, Jed, uh, Jediah, and Hen, son of Zephaniah. Even those from afar shall come and build the temple of the Lord. Then you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you, and this shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. Now, in these next two chapters, consider Jerusalem. He, they're, they're now saying, here's where we're at. What should we do? Should we continue mourning? Should we continue fasting? Or are we moving to the kingdom? Are we moving to joy? It says, now in the fourth year of King Darius, this is two years later, came to pass that the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month, Chislev. When the people sent Sherezer with Rejah Melech and his men to the house of God to pray before the Lord and to ask the priests who were in the house of the Lord of hosts and the prophets saying, here's the question, should I weep in the fifth month? Should I fast as I have done for so many years. Then the word of the Lord, the, uh, then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying, say to all the people of the land and to the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months during these 70 years, did you really fast for me? For me? When you eat and when you drink, do you not eat and drink for yourselves? Should you not have obeyed the words which the Lord proclaimed through the former prophets? When Jerusalem and the cities around it were inhabited and were prosperous, and the south and the lowlands were inhabited, then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Execute true justice. Show mercy and compassion. Everyone to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien of the poor. Let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. Now that sounds like what the previous prophets were calling them to. Right? But they had refused to heed, shrugging their shoulders, stopping their ears so they couldn't hear. Yes, they made their hearts like flint, refusing to hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent his prophets through the former prophets, or his spirit through the former prophets. Uh, thus great wrath came from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it happened that just as he had proclaimed that they would not hear, so they called out, and I would not listen, says the Lord of hosts. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among the nations which they had not known. Thus the land became desolate, so Jerusalem even, became desolate after them, so that no one passed through or returned, for they made the pleasant land desolate. It's the past into the present, right? Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Zion. With great zeal, with great fervor, I am zealous for her. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Now we're talking future. 
Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus says the Lord of hosts, old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each one with his staff in his hand because of great age. The streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. Thus says the Lord of hosts, if it is marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days, will it also be marvelous in my eyes, says the Lord of hosts. Thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I will save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west, and I will bring them back and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Thus says the Lord of hosts, let your hands be strong. You who have been hearing in these days the words of, uh, by the mouth of the prophets who spoke in the day, the foundation was laid for the house of the Lord of hosts that the temple might be built. For before these days, there were no wages for man nor any hire for beast. There was no peace from the enemy for whomever went out or came in for I, sent all, for I set all men, everyone against his neighbor. But now I will not treat the remnant of this people as in the former days, says the Lord of hosts. For the seed shall be prosperous and the vine shall give its fruit. The ground shall give her increase and the heavens shall give their due. I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these. And it shall come to pass that just as you were a curse among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so I will save you and you shall be a blessing. That sounds like an old promise too, doesn't it? Do not fear, let your hands be strong. For thus says the Lord of hosts, just as I determined to punish you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, says the Lord of hosts, uh, and I would not relent. So again in these days, I am determined to do good to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Do not fear. These are the things you shall do. Speak each man to the truth to his neighbor. Give judgment in your gates for truth, justice, and peace. Let none of you think evil in your heart and against your neighbor. And do not love a false oath, for all these are things that I hate, says the Lord. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth shall be joy and gladness and cheerful feasts for the house of Judah. Therefore, love, truth, and peace. Thus says the Lord of hosts, people shall yet come, inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another saying, let us continue to go and pray before the Lord and seek the Lord of hosts. I myself will go also. Yes, many peoples and strong nations shall come to the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus, thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, 10 men from every language of the nation shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So here's the solid break. Now 9 through 14, even more explicit, many messi messianic images back to back. Notice particularly uh, his authority as king and then his she the shepherd. Shepherd is brought through many times here. Okay, the burden of the word of the Lord against the land of Hadrach and Damascus, its resting place. For the eyes of men and all the tribes of Israel are on the Lord, also against Tamath, which borders on it, and against Tyre and Sidon, though they are very wise. For Tyre built herself a tower, heaped up silver like the dust, and gold like the mire of her streets. Behold, the Lord will cast her out. He will destroy her power in the sea, and she will be devoured by fire. These are all enemies, right? These are all foreign nations. Ashkelon shall see it in fear. Gaza also shall be very sorrowful and Ekron for he dried up her expectation. The king shall perish from Gaza and Ashkelon shall not be inhabited. A mixed race shall settle in Ashdod and I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. I will take away the blood from his mouth and the abominations from between his teeth. But he who remains, even he shall be for our God and shall be like a leader in Judah and Ekron like a Jebusite. I will camp around my house because of the army, because of him who passes by and of him who returns. No more shall an oppressor pass through them. For now I have seen with my eyes. 
Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Just notice those two verses back to back that like what we're talking about, incarnation and eschaton, married in Zechariah. Verse 11, as for you also, because of the blood of your covenant, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today, I declare that I will restore double to you. For I have bent Judah my bow, fitted the bow with Ephraim, and raised up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and made you like the sword of a mighty man. Then the Lord will be seen over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning, the Lord God will blow the trumpet and go to the whirlwinds from the, and will go with whirlwinds from the south. The Lord of hosts will defend them. They shall devour and subdue with sling stones. They shall drink and roar as if with wine. They shall be filled with blood like basins, like the corners of the altar. The Lord their God will save them in that day as the flock of his people, for they shall be like the jewels of a crown. Lifted like a banner over his land. For how great is his goodness and how great its beauty. Grain shall, be, or grain shall make the young men thrive and new wine the young women. Ask the Lord for rain. In the time of the latter rain, the Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. For the idols, here's purity, for the idols speak delusion. The diviners envision lies and tell false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, the people wend their way like sheep. They are in trouble because there is no shepherd. My anger is kindled against the shepherds, and I will punish the goat herds. For the Lord of hosts will visit his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them as his royal horse in the battle. From him comes the cornerstone, from him the tent peg, from him the battle bow, from him every ruler together. They shall be like mighty men who tread down their enemies in the mire of the streets in the battle. They shall fight because the Lord is with them and the riders on horses shall be put to shame. I will strengthen the house of Judah and I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back because I have mercy on them. They shall be as though I had not cast them aside. For I am the Lord their God, and I will hear them. Those of Ephraim shall be like a mighty man, and their heart shall rejoice as if with wine. Yes, their children shall see it and be glad. Their heart shall rejoice in the Lord, and I will whistle for them and gather them. For I will redeem them, and they shall increase as they once increased. I will sow them among the peoples, and they shall remember me in far countries. They shall live together with their children, and they shall return. I will also bring them back from the land of Egypt and gather them from Assyria. I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon until no more room is found for them. He shall pass through the sea with affliction and strike the waves of the sea. All the depths of the river shall dry up. Then the pride of Assyria shall be brought down and the scepter of Egypt shall depart. So I will strengthen them in the Lord and they shall walk up and down in his name, says the Lord. Open your doors, O Lebanon, that fire may devour your cedars. Wail, O Cyprus, for the cedar has fallen, as the mighty trees are ruined. Wail, O oaks of Bashan, for the thick forest has come down. There is the sound of wailing shepherds, for their glory is in ruins. There is the sound of roaring lions, for the pride of the Jordan is in ruins. This is a complex one, right? So hang with the imagery. Thus says the Lord my God, this is to a shepherd, feed the flock for slaughter. 
whose owners slaughter them and feel no guilt. Those who sell them say, blessed be the Lord, for I am rich. And their shepherds do not pity them. For I will no longer pity the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord. But indeed, I will give everyone into his neighbor's hand and into the hand of his king. They shall attack the land and I will not deliver them from their hand. So I, I did. So I fed the flock for slaughter. In particular, the poor of the flock. I took for myself two staffs. The one I called beauty and the other I called bonds and I fed the flock. I dismissed the three shepherds in one month. My soul loathed them and their soul also also abhorred me. Then I said, I will not feed you. Let what is dying die and what is perishing perish. Let those that are left eat each other's flesh. And I took my staff beauty and cut it in two that I might break the covenant which I had made with all the peoples. So it was broken on that day. Thus the poor of the flock who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. Then I said to them, if it is agreeable to you, give me my wages. He's done. He's retiring. (laughs) And if not, then refrain. So they weighed out for his wages 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, concerning that silver, throw it to the potter, that princely price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. Then I cut, the other, or then I cut into my other staff, bonds, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. And the Lord said to me, next, Take for yourself the implements of a foolish shepherd. For indeed, I will raise up a shepherd in the land who will not care for those who are cut off, nor seek the young, nor heal those who are broken, nor feed those that, will st- that still stand. But he will eat the flesh of the fat and tear their hooves in pieces. Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. A sword shall be against his arm and against his right eye. His arm shall completely wither and his right eye shall be totally blinded. Okay, the second part of the second half of the book, 12 through 14. Here's the pierced defender. The burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. Thus says the Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples, All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. In that day, says the Lord, I will strike every horse with confusion and its rider with madness. I will open my eyes on the house of Judah and will strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength in the Lord of hosts, their God. In that day, I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the wood pile, And like a fiery torch in the sheaves, they shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left. But Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, Jerusalem. The Lord will save the tents of Judah first, so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall not become greater than that of Judah. In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day shall be like David, And the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. In that day, there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning at Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and the wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of Shimei by itself, and their wives by themselves, all the families that remain, every family by itself, and their wives by themselves. In that day, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David 
and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and for uncleanness. It shall be in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land, and they shall no longer be remembered. I will also cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to depart from the land. It shall come to pass that if anyone still prophesies, then his father and mother who begot him will say to him, you shall not live because you have spoken lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and mother who begot him shall thrust him through when he falsely prophesies. In that day, it shall be that every prophet will be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. They will not wear a robe of coarse hair to deceive. For he will say, I am no prophet, I am a farmer. For a man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. And one will say to him, what are these wounds between your arms? And he will answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones, and it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. Then they will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. Final chapter and final image. This is uh, the day of the Lord, the king fighting for and reigning in Jerusalem. <clears throat> Behold, the day of the Lord is coming and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the house is rifled and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach Azal. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus, the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. It shall come to pass in that day that there will be no light. The lights will be diminished. It shall be one day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night. But at evening time, it shall happen that it will be light. And in that day, it shall be that living waters shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and half of them toward the western sea. In both summer and winter, it shall occur. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. It shall be, uh, in that day, it shall be, the Lord is one and his name one. All the land shall be turned into a plain from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem shall be raised up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate to the place of the first gate and the corner gate and from the tower of Hananel to the king's wine presses. The people shall dwell in it and no longer shall there be utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they, uh, while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongue shall dissolve in their mouth. It shall come to pass in that day that a great panic from the Lord will be among them. Everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against his neighbor's hand. Judah will also fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the surrounding nations shall be gathered together, gold, silver, and apparel in great abundance, such also shall be the plague on the horse and the mule and on the camel and the donkey and on all the cattle that will be in those camps. So shall this plague be. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. 
in that day. Holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses. The pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. Everyone who sacrifices shall come and take them and cook in them. In that day, there shall no longer be a Canaanite in the house of uh, in the Lord in the house of the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> Took thirty five minutes, not twenty. <clears throat> With the time, we probably should not have too much discussion. Just a couple brief notes, and then we'll, we'll be done. I find it quite encouraging in the middle of all those unique visions that Zechariah saying, what is that? <laughs> what, what is that? What is that? So it would be normal for us to read them and to say, what is that? Uh, and the angel of the Lord gives explanation, so it'll look forward to hearing those things. But the images are intentionally bizarre, so that's helpful. And I think one of the main differences between the second and third portions of the book, where the people are wondering in seven and eight, is this the time? Is this now? Do we keep mourning? Do we keep these, uh, you know, fasting, and these sorts of things? And he continues encouraging them with the same things that the prophets told the old people to do. He's telling them to live righteously because God's intention is that when there is a people that is fit for his presence, it's done. So he calls them to that. He says, absolutely. Live righteously. There I am. And it's not really till the end of the book that you see, he must curate that righteousness. He places it in the people. He creates them. And then and only then is there not a tongue uh, that, that speaks against him. Not only, it's only then that there is every tongue that says the Lord is one. And so that, I think that will help a little bit with the promises of Zechariah to the people at this time as we understand the, the remaining history of redemption. As we understand then the silence and the incarnation and the spiritual establishment of the kingdom and where we're at now and where we're going. It all sort of helps make sense of those realities. Um, so for the sake of time tonight, we won't probably open it up for questions. If you have specific ones or things that you're particularly wanting to address, then feel free to talk to me after or, or send me a text sometime this week. Looking forward to jumping into this book uh, in more detail with you all. Let's close it. Father, thank you for the book of Zechariah. Thank you for this post-exilic word to your people um, who are in the midst of freedom and hope and establishing so sort of from the 